Welcome to the second lesson of The Dream House, the selected IEB novel for English home language. Today we continue with the first part or act of the novel. This lesson should take no longer than one hour to complete. After lesson one, you should have a grasp of the foreword of the novel. To consolidate that knowledge, I'd like you to read pages 39 to 45 in the English Experience Study Guide. After that, please answer the two questions on page 44. I do realise that some of you won't have this book as it's not a mandatory purchase at every school. If you don't have this guide, not to worry as I will deal with the questions in a way that hopefully will make the information accessible to all of you. For those of you who don't have the study guide with you, here are the two questions. Pause the video as you jot down your responses in your notebooks. The mark allocation is just a guideline. I always tell my students that the number of marks gives an indication of expected answer length. So two marks would be four lines of writing and three marks, six lines. It's a very rough guide, but you might find that helpful in the exam room. These are the model answers taken from the study guide. What you should get from the first question is that our surroundings do exert a power over us. Where you were raised, in terms of country, city, suburb, street, even dwelling, has a huge influence over the type of person you become. For the second answer, if you're lucky enough to have a home where you can find refuge and solace, it gives you the freedom to dream to explore your imagination. You will now be introduced to Beauty, one of the remaining farm workers at Dwaleni. She's a domestic worker who has the unenviable task of seeing to the needs of Richard Wiley. Pause the video as you read pages 13 to 15 of the novel. Beauty and Richard have a complicated relationship. Beauty is clearly the employee, the servant, but Richard's dominance is waning as his mental faculties deteriorate. Richard seems to be aware of this and so strives to exert his power over beauty. Higginson has put on display that uniquely South African relationship, the white boss with his colonial paternalism and the black servant who is expected to devote most of her waking hours to meeting the needs and obeying the orders, often unreasonable, of her employer. This relationship is a legacy of South Africa's colonial and apartheid past. South African readers of this post-apartheid novel should feel discomfort as they realise that not much has changed in many post-apartheid communities, particularly in rural areas. This bath scup is still very much a way of life. Higginson effectively shines an uncompromising light on this in order to challenge his readers. Higginson goes further by not providing a glossary for the Isizulu dialogue I would like you to think about the role that language plays in post-apartheid South Africa. Language is used as a tool, a weapon even, that can place speakers of one language in a position of power over speakers of another language. The imagery in this section focuses our attention on past glories and triumphs. The world that the Wileys inhabited has changed irrevocably, but they hang on to the objects associated with their past lives. The incongruity of commemorative crockery celebrating the British royal family on a rural KwaZulu-Natal farm is obvious. 
The tea drinking ritual, so often seen as a stereotypical British attribute, has been expropriated by beauty, the Zulu servant. The irony is obvious. Should you need help with the translation of the Isi Zulu dialogue, pause the video here to annotate your text. The next slide is an 18 minute audio recording of Dr. Marlene Zwicher's reading Patricia's account of her affair with the retired headmaster, John Ford. It is in this section that we shall first encounter Look Smart, a catalyst in the novel. Patricia, page 16 to 21. They have been lovers for over 30 years. It doesn't matter that they have hardly touched in 15 of them and that they only see each other every other month. As soon as they are together again, some of the old feeling re-enters the air. A feeling they have never spoken about to anyone. Since John was a young English teacher at the school and Patricia, a spirited farmer's wife who bred Welsh ponies for other people's children. These days, John Ford looks like an aged dog, lopsided, softened by whiskey and golf. He was once famous for his Hollywood looks, his uh, spin bowling and his temper. The ever-present silver pipe earned him the nickname Dacha at the school. He has since retired to a house on a windy hill just outside the school grounds where he lives alone with his television and his books. His wife, who was milder and gentler than he, died of bone cancer several years after he became the headmaster. Patricia likes to think that she fell in love with him because he was everything Richard was not. John claimed to have read the complete works of Tolstoy twice, while Richard would occasionally page through the Farmer's Weekly on the loo. John could recite whole passages from plays Patricia had never even heard of, while Richard could recall only his permanent sense of grievance. Patricia called herself a Christian for much of her adult life, not because she believed in God, but because she wanted to be near John, who would stand in the village chapel in his academic gown, his baritone sounding clear above the sweet and disinterested singing of the boys. She liked it. When John helped out with communion, he would dissolve the dry wafer on her outstretched tongue with that cheap, sticky wine. The goblet always held just beyond her reach. As the car comes to a stop on the gravel driveway, he's there to meet her at the front door. He's dressed for golf, which is his way of saying they don't have long, but this suits her. She has no need to linger there. What would be the point? They already said goodbye the previous week, and if it weren't for his phone call last night, in which he said he'd like to see her one last time, she wouldn't be here at all. Becky parks as close as he can to the entrance of the yellow brick bungalow, extracts the walker from the boot and helps lift Patricia from a seat. She is laughing, as usual, to ward off any threat of awkwardness, 
Hello, John. I see you're already dressed for your morning round. How you've been? The mist hasn't cleared. Hello, Trish. Glad you could make it. She follows him through the house, which smells of tobacco smoke and shoe polish, and out to the shadow stone paved stoop at the back. This has been the site of most of their exchanges since John's retirement. In fact, she hasn't been into the bedroom since they last had sex. She can hardly recall when the sex stopped or how, but there could be no doubt that the decision would have been his. The veranda stands at the crest of a hill that descends without contradiction all the way down to the village chapel. If the wind is blowing in the right direction on a Sunday morning, you can hear the organ and the drone of familiar hymns. Patricia has long since stopped going to church, but John still attends without fail. The old headmaster, handing out the body and blood of Christ to rows of disbelievers. <laughs> Patricia liked to joke that she was yet to meet an Anglican who actually believed in God. Two rows of lime green pin oaks stand along both borders of the lawn. His wife's roses, which grow along the edge of the stoop, were transplanted from a rose garden at the school. For her rose garden was legendary. While it existed, but what was left of it has since been swallowed up by a bank of rhododendrons. Patricia notices that the roses are in need of deadheading, but it is their custom never to mention his wife, Anna, well, even indirectly. The subject tends to leave an aftertaste of disappointment. What light lingers between the two of them has been no match for the afterglow that has grown up around Anna since her death. Uh, so you're uh, off tomorrow, he says, already knowing the answer. Straight after breakfast, without a backward glance, I hope. <laughs> In my experience, Backward glances only crick the neck. He pours a tea, the way she likes it, and passes her a Romany cream. They contemplate the grey dripping void ahead of them. A buzzard appears, flying brokenly, harassed along by two pied crows. I was uh, surprised you phoned. She says, is everything all right? Oh, quite all right. I suppose I was feeling sentimental. You? Sentimental? That doesn't sound like you. Doesn't it? He looks at the Romany creams and decides to take one. This is also unusual. He's generally strict about his diet and takes a grim satisfaction in watching her eat. I'll phone you every Sunday evening, she says. You will? Well, to tell you how I'm surviving Durban. As she says this, she imagines he will be relieved to see her go. He will finally be left alone with his wife. There has been a melancholy tone in much he has said and done with her in recent months. And she often feels 
she has become little more to him than an object of pity. John has always been a difficult man. At the decisive moment, he has tended to withhold himself, not only from Patricia, but from Anna, his children, his colleagues, even the boys at the school. It's little wonder he has so few friends and that his two children bolted to Australia. A vain man, she reflects sadly, with little more to offer these days than a few cups of tea and a disinclined ear. Well, you don't have to call every week, he says, only when you have something interesting to say. Well, if we wait for that, you'll never hear from me again. They laugh, sort of, and sip their tea. You've, um, you've been a good friend, he tells her, as have you. He waves her away with a puffed up brown hand, more like a paw, weathered and leathery and tobacco stained. Even now his pipe is sitting in his pocket, waiting to be extracted, which he will do, no doubt, as soon as she has left. They first met when Patricia brought an unusually clever boy from the farm for an interview. She could see that John was far more interested in her than the silent boy at her side. She was still a radiant, laughing woman back then, able to distribute warmth wherever she wished. What do you want the boy educated for? He had asked her, as though the boy wasn't in the room. Because he's clever, and I want him to use his cleverness for the general good. So John, the facilitator, the fixer, arranged a scholarship for the boy, whose name was Look Smart. But the meetings between the two continued. First in his office, who to discuss Look Smart's astonishing progress, and then, for several years afterwards, at the nearby Rawdon's Hotel. The rooms were comfortable, the room service affordable, and the manager famously discreet. Can't you get rid of him? Who? Richard. When you get to Durban. Well, what do you suggest I do with him? Or oh, send him to a home? John has always enjoyed belittling Richard, and he has continued to do so even since Richard's presence has grown so small. John has almost certainly come to think less of her for continuing to harbour her husband. And it still irks her, the way Richard is forever available for mockery while Anna must remain like a saint in stained glass. But then she has been just as complicit in all of this as he. I, I can't do that, although I suppose I could get a nurse to take care of him. That way I won't have to visit him. All I need to do is look across the breakfast table now and again. <laughs> they laugh once more, almost feeling bad about themselves in a way that is familiar. Incidentally, he says, shifting in his seat like one about to impart bad news, um, I, I have something I'd like to give you. Oh, yes. Following the, his gaze, 
She sees an envelope on the table, placed there with prominence, even though she has only now noticed it. What is that? It looks like a letter of resignation uh, or condolence. A letter for me? I'd like you to open it when you get down there to, to Durban. But you must promise me not to look at it before that. <laughs> He's looking rather sweet and bashful suddenly. He has never been very good at expressing tenderness. Even their first kiss resembled a mistake. It was something he did as they were getting up, as one of their conversations about the boy look smart was officially ended. For a man who has been in control for so much of his life, John's more intimate maneuvers have always had a lurching, heady quality. I'll read it as soon as I've unpacked. Oh, don't do that, he laughs. You forget, I've seen the inside of your house. Oh, it takes a long time to die, she thinks. Thinking as much about Anna as herself, as she angles her body back into the passenger seat, while Becky holds the walker and nudges it in with a shopping. She stares ahead, feeling annoyed, even though she can't quite place the source of it. In her hand is John's unopened letter, which he stuffs into the cubbyhole, along with all the unopened bank statements from the village post box. She notices with some satisfaction that John who has always tried to avoid saying goodbye or even hello, has already slipped back into the safety of the house. She doesn't know why he summoned her here to give her that letter, to apologize for himself, to, to try to explain why he never loved her as much as he loved his wife. Well, she didn't think she would ever read his letter. She was tired of him and his unspoken rules and his complacency. Let him go and play golf and knock that silly little white ball up and down those stretches of grass that never culminated in anything. The car reeks of petrol. As it does whenever they fill her up. But she and Becky say nothing about this. Nor anything else on the journey back to the farm. <laughs> the whole of the Midlands is engulfed in cloud and the windows of the car uh, are still smeared opaque by the dead dog's noses. There is much of importance in this section the mundane details of small town life, the references to church, God, Christianity, the duplicity and setting aside of widely accepted moral standards, the commentary on the two marriages, the Wileys and the Fords, the paternalistic, possibly smug attitude as a benevolent white woman bestows the gift of education at a prestigious school so that the recipient of the scholarship can, in her words, use his cleverness for the general good. It's a gift with strings attached, which should make you wonder what Patricia's motivation was. And of course, you should note the significance of Look Smart's name. Take note of the descriptions of the various settings and always the imagery employed by Higginson. Highlight any sentences that stand out to you and consider them. 
I was struck by these two. John still attends church without fail, handing out the body and blood of Christ to rows of disbelievers. And it takes a long time to die. There is an air of disillusionment that hangs heavily over the characters we have encountered in these first pages of the novel. On this slide, there are five questions for you to consider. If you're able, chat to some classmates and ask their opinions. It is in these discussions about the novel that your own thoughts will start to crystallize and you'll discover your own voice, which is what your teachers and examiners wish to hear when you respond to the essay question in the exam. Spend the rest of this hour completing the annotation of the text and updating your own notes. I trust that you found this video lesson helpful. Until next time. Stay safe, everybody.